Uh, thank you for your flexibility and your faithfulness and your generosity. So we've been talking about how the first story in the Bible tells us some of the most foundational truth about God and humanity, and we're finding six of them. The first one we said God exists, and he is the creator. Second, we said the biblical creation story makes perfect sense. Again, all of these messages are on our website, on video. We've also got podcasts on Apple Podcasts and Spotify Podcasts. So if you missed any of these in this series, you can go back and get them. God exists and he is the creator. The biblical creation story makes perfect sense. Third, we said humanity was created in the image of God. And as part of that, we said the image of God is in you and the image of God is in every person. Fourth, we found that God designed male and female with intention and purpose. And then last week, we started on the fifth foundational truth we find in this first story in the Bible, and that is God provided. And I want to pick up and talk about that even more this morning. We said last week that we found in the scriptures there, in the beginning of the story, Genesis 1 and 2, that there are four areas of provision that we find. First, we found that God is the provider of our food. Everybody said, praise Amen. the Lord for that. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Genesis chapter 1, verses 29 and through 31. Then God said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. And I have given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the small animals that scurry along the ground, everything that has life. And that is what happened. Then God looked over all that he had made and he saw that it was very good. And evening passed, and morning came, marking the sixth day. So God's the provider of our food. Second, we found God is the provider of our life and breath. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Everybody on the earth has been blessed by God because they've got the breath of life in them. Third, we found out that God is the provider of our wealth. And again, we talked about that doesn't mean wealthy. It just means that everything we have, whatever we have, has been given to us by God. Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 through, tw or 8 through 12. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden he placed the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You want a little forecast into the future when we get through this series next week? The following week, the following couple weeks, we're going to start on a series about getting back to the tree of life. We're going to spend several weeks talking about the differences that are implied in the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and a lot of us live in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but by God's grace, we can get back into the tree of life kind of life and kind of thinking. So that's coming in a few weeks. A river flowed from the land of Eden watering the garden and then dividing into four branches. The first branch called the Pishon flowed around the entire land of Havilah where gold is found. The gold of that land is exceptionally pure. And in fourth we found last week God is the provider of all of our resources. Genesis chapter 2 verses 12 through 14. Aromatic resin and ox stone are also found there. The second branch called the Gihon flowed around the entire land of Cush. The third branch called the Tigris flowed out of the land of Asher. The fourth branch is called the Euphrates. And so we talked about last week how in this earth, God has given us everything. I don't know how, I don't know how this thing right here came from the earth. But every material that was present to make this nice, lightweight, aren't you glad for nice, lightweight plastic table? If you went to church 40 years ago, you had to carry around 100-pound steel and wood tables, you know? Things, you can pick them up and throw them like a discus, you know? But, but, but somehow, the, the material for this is in the ground. It's in the earth. It's part of creation, everything we have. So God's the provider of our food. God's the provider of our life and breath. God's the provider of our wealth. And God's the provider of all of our resources. So today... What happens when we realize that God is the provider? What happens when we realize that God is the provider? That's what we want to talk about today. The Apostle Paul writes from prison in Philippians chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And, and it's, not a, it's not a nice place. It's not a nice prison. We came over here today because... We wanted to sit in the air conditioning. Like I said at the beginning of the service, we can live without screens and sound systems, but we don't want to live without air conditioning. I kind of thought, I kind of thought about just you know getting some sawdust and throwing sawdust down the aisles, and we could pretend we're in a 1940s tent revival or something. And I could go to the funeral home and get some fans, and we could all fan ourselves, you know, like 
but I figure you'd want to be in here instead of doing all of that kind of stuff. But, but, but Paul is in a prison that doesn't have uh, uh, streaming television. You know, he, he's not in a prison that's got air conditioning. He is, he is in an awful place when he writes to the Philippians. He's in one of the worst prisons in the history of the world, Mamertine Prison in Rome. He is, he's in an awful place. I mean, it is hot. It is sweaty. It is stinky. There's the smell of filth, the smell of sewage, and, and yet he writes this letter to the Philippians, and it's full of joy. How can he be full of joy when he is in such an awful place, and he's been treated so terribly? It's because he recognizes that God is our provider. So what happens when we realize that God's our provider? Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, at the moment I have all I need. He's in one of the worst prisons in the history of the world. And he says, at the moment, I, I got everything I need right here. And more. I have everything I need and more. I am generously supplied. And then he says, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. I've got an outline in the handout if you'd like to follow along with me and take some notes. What happens when we recognize that God is our provider? Number one, grumbling goes away. Amen. When we recognize God is our provider, grumbling goes away. Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 verses 12 and 13, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Amen. And so because Paul recognized God as his provider, he was able to be content in all of his circumstances, pleasant circumstances, and sometimes very unpleasant circumstances, and if you know anything about the life and ministry of Paul, there was plenty, plenty of unpleasant hardship in his life, especially after he started following Jesus. He writes a little summary of some of the stuff that he went through in 2 Corinthians, his second letter to the church in Corinth. Chapter 11, verses 23 to 28, he says, I have worked harder. I have put in, put in prison more often. I have been whipped times without number. Think of that. I've been whipped so many times I can't even keep track of it anymore. Whipped times without number. I've faced death again and again. Five times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Now you say, you say, well, uh, he just said he's been whipped time without number, and then he said the Jews gave him 39 lashes. I thought, I thought it was, if he said time without number, how can it be five? Because the Jewish whipping was limited to 39 lashes. That was in the Jewish law. But he wasn't only whipped by the Jews. He was whipped by others from time to time. And here's another interesting fact. When Jesus was whipped, a lot of people say he took 39 lashes. No, Jesus was beaten by the Romans, not by the Jews. The law that Jesus was beaten under did not have the limitation of 39. The only limitation there was keep them barely enough alive so that they can be tortured on the cross. Just a little bit of trivia there. But Paul said, I've been whipped times without number, faced death again and again. Five times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rocks. As if, as if a whipping that lashes the skin off of your back isn't enough. Rods beaten down on his back, breaking his ribs. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I've faced danger in the cities and in the deserts and on the seas. And I've faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. And then I really like this last phrase. He says, then besides all of this, I have the daily burden of my concern for all the churches. <laughs> so, so Paul's like, I'm, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you all the horrible stuff I've endured. I've been whipped. I've been beaten. I've been beaten with rods. I've been stoned. I've been shipwrecked. I've been cold. I've been, I've been hungry. I've starved. I've been all of this stuff. But you know what? That doesn't even compare to the way some of the churches have, have treated me and the concern that I've got for the church people. You know? I mean, 
So, so Paul is some kind of character. He maintained an attitude of peace and joy. I, I dare say, I know, I, know, I know some have had some difficult times. There ain't no doubt about it. I am not minimizing. I'm not minimizing the difficult times that some people in this room have gone through. But I would dare say that our list doesn't compare to the list from the Apostle Paul that I just read. And yet he's able to have peace. He's able to have joy. How? Because he recognized God as his provider. So we can do the same when we recognize God as the provider of everything we have. And God's the provider of everything we need. So let's, let's not be complainers. Let's not be whiners. Jesus said he came to give us an abundant life. And with him, we have abundance no matter what our bank account says. We have abundance with Jesus no matter what our bank account says. So I don't want to be like the Israelites in the desert. You know, the, the people of God who were slaves in Egypt for 400 years, and God performs miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle to deliver them from slavery. So they're out of slavery, and they're on their way to a promised land where the Lord said, you're going to live in homes you don't even build. You're going to eat from gardens you don't even plant. He says, I'm going to bless you like you have never been blessed before, and you don't deserve it. It's my grace, but you've been slaves for 400 years, but I have got such awesome plans for you. God brought them out of slavery, and they complained. God caused water to gush out of rocks in the desert, and they complained. God caused water poisonous water to become healthy enough to drink and they complained. God caused sweet bread to just rain down from the sky for their food and they complained. God gave them abundant quail for daily food and they complained. And an entire generation was not able to see the promise of God because of their complaining. When Paul went to Philippi, we read from this letter he wrote to the Philippians, when he went to Philippi to start that church, he was arrested, and he was beaten within an inch of his life. What does he do? Acts chapter 16 tells us he praises God in the prison. He's sitting there in stocks, you know, when they got you put your head in this wooden thing, and they put your arms there, and they put your feet in there. So at midnight, he's already been beaten to smithereens. He's had a whip come down on his back who knows how many times. His back is wide open and raw, bloody bleeding. Him and Silas are there, and now they're, they're put in stocks. Anybody ever <laughs> anybody ever wake up in the middle of the night with a cramp in your foot or your leg and you wake up your spouse because oh 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 boy, oh boy got me got me a good one here but 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 you can get out of bed and you can walk around and you can rub it and you can work that cramp out you get cramped up when you're in stocks you can't move I mean they're beaten they're bloody they're in excruciating pain but what are they doing at midnight they're singing praises to God again We've gone through a lot less that causes us to jump off the bandwagon of serving the Lord, praising the Lord, and following the Lord. Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If we would get the same attitude Paul had in the midst of his struggles and hardships and difficulties, no one or nothing would be able to destroy us. Think of it. They say to Paul, we are going to throw you in prison. He says, that's awesome. I've got some letters to the churches I've been meaning to write, and I haven't gotten caught up on those yet. Yeah, throw, throw away the key. Let me get caught up on those letters. Well, we're going to kill you. He says, that's awesome to live as Christ, to die as gain. I'd rather be in the presence of the Lord anyway. And I know some people might look. It, Paul also told us it's a dangerous thing for us to start comparing ourselves with one another. It's a dangerous thing. For us to start comparing ourselves with one another. Sometimes we can look at other people and say, well, they don't know the hardship I'm going through. They, they, haven't, they, they don't understand. You might even look at me and say, Pastor, Pastor, you don't understand. You've lived a privileged life. I've, I've had people tell me, you know, oh, you're, you're just a goody two-shoes. You don't understand. Guys that have been through some really difficult stuff in their lives. I know they've been through some difficult stuff in their lives. But they get into this comparison game and they say, Pastor, you don't know nothing about this. You, you don't know nothing about what I've been through. Can I tell you something? You don't know nothing about what I've been through. What I've been through don't matter compared to what you've been through. What you've been through don't matter compared to what I've been through. We're to rejoice no matter what our circumstances are. We're to recognize that God is our provider. When we recognize that God is our provider, then the grumbling will go away. You know what I was reminded of this morning? We came in here, and we set up this little portable keyboard, and we brought in the chairs from the other room. We were pulling in chairs, stacks of chairs, and... Setting them down, you know what it reminded me of? Planting two churches. 
I planted two churches. I started out in the first church. I was single in my first church. We started out meeting in a Grange Hall. You all know what a Grange Hall is? Little Farmer's Fellowship Hall. Six months we set up in there. And then after that, we moved into a, uh, a uh, uh, senior citizen facility for three and a half years. For three and a half years, we were setting up and tearing down, setting up and tearing down, setting up and tearing down. We finally built our building, and we were in the building one year before the Lord called me to the Philippines. So I got a church building and an office one year out of five years in that opportunity for ministry. We come back from the Philippines. I'll tell you a little about that in a little bit. We come back from the Philippines, and uh, Sharon and I started church on the northwest side of Indianapolis, and we meet in, in the lobby of a daycare facility. And literally, the lobby was just about from here to that wall. That was all there was. We could set up 92 folding chairs in this area. We had standing room only some Sundays, but, but we had to keep the folding chairs in boxes upstairs. Every Sunday morning, we would bring them boxes downstairs, set up the chairs, set up all the portable sound equipment. I would put it all in the back of my Chevy Cavalier, speakers, pianos, uh, sound system, whatever, and it would go on the back of the Chevy Cavalier, and then I'd take it home and store it in the little closet of the 900-square-foot apartment we lived in when we had two kids. And, and, and we would do that week after week after week after week. And I think we were three and a half years in that daycare center before we were able to get property and build property. So I was reminded a little bit this morning setting up chairs and, and all this for, of my church planting. But I started two churches from scratch. Didn't have any families committed. Actually, actually the church of Bell Fountain, Ohio, when I was 20 years old, the first church, we had two families. I was, I was approved by the Ohio district to start this new church in Bell Fountain, Ohio, in February of 1984. And they said, we've already got two families that have moved there. They want to help start them, and some of them got a church in the area. Well, I didn't graduate until April, and I didn't get there until May. Between February and May, these two families had already found two other churches to go to. So this was a great start. I planned a church, and I lost two families before I even got started. <laughs> so so the, only, the only recent picture I had of myself was my high school senior picture. And I put my high school senior picture in the newspaper with a little article. We're going to start having Bible studies, you know. I planted that church, then we planted another church in Indianapolis. You, you don't go into church planting for the sake of the salary, let me tell you. And when I left the first church in Ohio, the district leadership came in to help them in the process of getting another pastor. And the district leadership complained to the board I had that they weren't paying me enough. And the board had to look back at the district leadership and say, you guys are the ones who set the salary and told us what to pay him. <laughs> so I've been through that. And uh, I've lived in a third world country. Sharon and I were in the Philippines uh, before our first wedding anniversary. When we were there, it was just before the first Gulf War broke out in 1991. So it was before that before that first Gulf War broke out in 1991, the Philippines was listed by the U.S. State Department as being the most dangerous country to live in where we had an American embassy because Middle Eastern terrorists were in the Philippines just outside of Manila training rebels in the Philippines to overthrow the government. So actually, when the Gulf War broke out, Abdul Nabi, the leading terrorist at the time, that was before Osama bin Laden, Abdul Nabi went back to the Middle East because the Gulf War broke out. When the Gulf War broke out, it made the Philippines a whole lot safer. But we had to call the American Embassy on Thursday, Friday, every day to find out where the rumor was of the attempted coup there. We would find out where we were supposed to go and where we were not supposed to go because they were killing and kidnapping American businessmen and military people. And they, and, and they pulled all of the Peace Corps workers out. We had more Peace Corps workers in the Philippines at that time than any other place. They pulled all the Peace Corps workers out. And people were so critical. They said, oh, they're not going to do anything to Peace Corps workers. When they pulled all the Peace Corps workers out, they had one missing. And he had been kidnapped. Shortly after we, we left the Philippines, uh, there's the story of Martin and Gracia Burnham, who were kidnapped. They were kidnapped from a place where Sharon and I were, very close to where Sharon and I were. They were, they were taken through the jungle by these terrorists for a year. And when the rescue attempt happened, Martin was killed and Gracia was injured. And she still lives with the injury to this day. We had to call that. And one of the places they told us not to go, the office that I worked in for the Assemblies of God for Global University, three days a week, was right in the center of where they told us not to go all the time. So actually, Sharon was my bodyguard because she was pregnant. 
And so I grew my hair long and grew my beard long, and I got to where I kind of like that, you know. But they were they were looking for military guys and American businessmen. So if I had long hair and a long beard and was walking around with a pregnant wife because they didn't want to kidnap women and children, she was my she was my bodyguard. And we kept going every week into the place where the American embassy was telling us over and over and over again not to go. We lived two blocks from the main military base where the most recent coup and overthrow of the government had taken place. We had two blocks to the other direction. We had a bomb go off just two blocks from our house. And then we are expecting our first child. We're expecting our first child, and my mother comes over at age 50 for the birth of her first grandchild. Sharon's mother comes over at age 70. She makes the trip at age 70 to the Philippines for the birth of our first child. And for some reason, Sharon don't want to give birth. <laughs> she, she, don't, she don't want to go into labor. We get her in the four-wheel drive and go around Manila, hitting every pothole we possibly can, banging every curb we possibly can, trying to shake that baby out. We can't shake that baby out. And she's nine days overdue. Nine days overdue. And this is a Wednesday. And we have one of those prenatal appointments. Again, you're in a third world country. You, 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 you're wondering about the medical care you might get and so forth. We, we've heard other stories. Some, some missionaries had gone ahead and had their babies out in the province, out in the bush, outside of Manila because they wanted to be real missionaries. Didn't, didn't work out well, let me tell you. But so we stayed in Manila. And so this Wednesday, nine days overdue, we go in for the prenatal appointment. The doctor runs some kind of a test. And by the way, the doctor ends up later becoming the president of the Philippine Medical Association. She was sharp. God blessed us with a tremendous, tremendous doctor and caregiver. So, so she runs this test, and she says, she says, I think you need to come back on Saturday morning. She says, uh, we ran a test. Uh, the amniotic fluid running a little low. And she said, I think, I think you need to come back in um, Saturday morning and we'll run the test again and she said we hope the baby will come naturally but we might have to take the baby Friday afternoon two days later we're relaxing at home at about 4 30 in the afternoon she calls up she says are you coming in today I said no you told us to come in tomorrow she says well I think you'd better come in today and so we go we pack up all of our gear we're not sure what's going to happen and we go in and she does the test and she comes out she tells me I think we're going to have to take the baby so we're going through a c-section in a third world country in the middle of the night That'll, that'll cause you to pray. That'll cause you to look to the Lord. That'll cause you to say, Lord, Lord, what have I done? I've left my whole family. I've left everything behind. I've come here for you. What, what, what's going to happen? She brings the baby out, and she comes out to talk to me afterwards, and she says, she says, it's a good thing we took the baby when we did. There was no amniotic fluid left. God spoke to her. God spoke to her on Friday and told us to come in on Friday instead of Saturday. Saved our baby's life. And, of course, I, I, I go to see where Sharon is at 2 o'clock in the morning. Where is she? Laying on a gurney in a hallway. That, that, that's the recovery room in the Philippines. You just, just lay on a gurney in a hallway all night, you know, until somebody comes and does something for you. She's finally back in the room the next day, five days in the hospital, five days out of the hospital, and our daughter's not eating. She's not taking anything. She loses 20% of her birth weight. She goes from 7 pounds, 4 ounces down to 5 pounds, 2 ounces. She's a little tiny skeleton. I, I wish I could show you a picture I have. She's just a skeleton with, with skin sagging on her. And the pediatrician, he just says, I just try a different kind of formula. Our baby's dying, and we don't know why. And, and God saved your life in the birth. How, how, what's going to happen? And so we're at the 10-day point now, five days in the hospital, five days out of the hospital. The baby's not eating. She's, she's, she's losing weight like crazy. Sharon goes to one of her postnatal appointments. And after she's done, she looks at the doctor and she says, would you please look at our baby? I know she's passed off to the pediatrician now, but you look at our baby. But she said, of course. We, we took Anna in there, and, and the doctor looked at her, and she called the pediatrician. She said, you admit this baby to the hospital right now. She was put in the hospital, found that she had gotten staph infection in the hospital shortly after birth, five more days in the hospital. Then she had to have a series of shots when there was no muscle on the leg, just skin. And we had to have a missionary for weeks put these shots in her. Um, and so, so the first time God saved your life, the second time God saved your life. But through all of that, we just had to trust God and trust God and trust God and trust God. Today, she's co-pastoring a church with her husband and preaching 
the word of God. She's a powerful, powerful God that woman God is. So folks, God is our healer. God is our provider. So let's let's not get into the comparison stories. Yes, amen. Let's not get into the comparison stories and look at somebody else and say, you don't know what I'm going through. I might not what you're going through, but you don't know what I've gone through either. And that's just one of the stories in our lives, okay? So when we recognize that God is our provider, grumbling will be out. Grumbling will be out. Secondly, when we recognize God is our provider, giving will be in. Mm -hmm. Giving will be in. We not only trust that God is our provider, we become generous givers. A spirit of generosity will overwhelm us when we realize that God provides for everything we need. Philippians chapter 4 again, verses 15 and 16. Paul says, as you know, you Philippians were the only ones <coughs> who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news and then traveled on from Macedonia. No other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help more than once. So he writes to the Philippians. He says, you were the first ones to support me. You were the first ones to give to my ministry. You gave to my ministry multiple times. What kind of... Oh, they must, they must have been well off. They must have been a really blessed church, right? In order, to, in order to give so much. No, Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he says, in the midst of a very severe trial... The, Phil, the, the Philippians, I almost said Philippines, kind of confusing. The Philippians, he says, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty. So put these two letters together. He writes to the Philippians, he said, you were the first ones to give to the ministry. You gave to the ministry over and over again. You were great supporters of the ministry. Don't think that they were a wealthy church. He tells them they were a church in extreme poverty. In extreme poverty. But he says, in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves to the Lord first. And then by the will of God also to us. What does it say? It says they urgently pleaded for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. They've given and they've given and they've given. They're not rich people. They're poor people. And they're going to Paul and saying, when are you going to take up the next offering? When, when can we give more? We want to give more. We're so blessed in giving. And the blessings are not always measured in finances, folks. That's a mistake a lot of people make. Oh, oh, I, I need $1,000 to pay for something. I'm going to put $100 in the offering plate. If I, put a, I heard somebody testify once that they put $100 in the offering plate, and that Wednesday in the mail, they got a $1,000 provision. But I'll tell you what, if all you look for is the provisions that can be measured with money, you'll miss the real blessings that God wants to give you because there are blessings that money can't buy. Amen. So he's talking about a poor church who gave again and again, and then they asked. They asked for the privilege of giving again. How could they do this? He says they gave themselves to the Lord first. If we give ourselves and everything we have to the Lord, then we'll be obedient to whatever he leads us to do. They recognized that God was their provider. He had provided for them, and they recognized that he would continue to provide for their every need. Can that be said of us? Can that be said of us? Folks, we, we cannot keep complaining about the economy and be putting ourselves and others down in the dumps. Right. We're better than that. We're God's people. We are citizens of heaven first, citizens of the country second. So the president, the senate, the congress, the Federal Reserve Bank, Wall Street, our employers, none of them have anything to do with our provision when we realize God is the provider. That's right. So grumbling is out. Giving is in. I'm not only going to avoid grumbling, I'm going to keep on giving. Proverbs 25, 21. If your enemies are hungry, give them food to eat. If they're thirsty... Give them water to drink. Isaiah 58, 7 through 9. Share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. Do not hide from relatives who need your help. <laughs> You're laughing. You're, I'm glad you're paying attention. I have read that verse so many, so many, so many times, and I was going over these notes again just this morning before we came here, and that line just stood out to me. Don't hide from relatives who need your help. Hey, hey. Honey, honey, Uncle Bob's coming over again. Close the windows, turn the lights off. We know what he's coming for. Hi, hi. Pretend you're not home. 
<laughs> oh, wait, wait. Who's, who's that calling? Oh, I know who that is. That's old Uncle Bob. He just wants more money. <laughs> don't hide. The scripture says don't hide. Just stood out to me. So that's a word for somebody. Do not hide from relatives who need your help. Then your salvation will come like the dawn, and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer, yes, I am here, he will reply. Do you want to be blessed? Do you want God to protect you and hear you? Then give out of your abundance or out of your poverty, you give. Matthew 5, 42 says, give to those who ask. Don't turn away from those who want to borrow. Give willingly. Give cheerfully. Give as unto the Lord, because we're not given to Uncle Bob, we're given to the Lord. You know, a story, I heard this story many, many years ago. A churchgoer said to a friend, he said, you know, our church just costs too much. They're always asking for money. And the friend replied, well, some time ago a little boy was born in our home. He cost a little money, a lot of money, right from the very beginning. He had a big appetite, he needed clothes, he needed medicine, he needed toys, he needed a puppy. When he went to school, that cost a lot more. Later, he went to college, and that cost a small fortune. And in his senior year at college, he died. And since the funeral, he hasn't cost me a penny. Now, which situation do you think I would rather have? Folks, as long as the church is alive, we'll need to be givers. And when we recognize that God has provided everything we need and will continue to do so, grumbling is out, giving is in, and yes, I prepared this message before the air conditioner went out and before I called him in on the full replacement, this message was already prepared. Just say, okay? So number one, grumbling is out. Number two, giving is in. What else happens when we recognize God as our provider? Number three, God will meet all of our needs. God will meet all of our needs. Philippians 4.19, this same God who takes care of me. This is Paul talking here, all he's been through, and he's writing this to the church who gave out of their poverty. Not a rich church, they gave out of their poverty. This same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. God will meet all of your financial needs. God will meet all of your emotional needs. What Paul is talking about in Philippians is contentment. Even more than provision, he's talking about contentment. It is a letter about joy. A guy is in one of the worst dungeons, in one of the worst physical situations a person can be in in the history of man. And he's writing a letter about joy and peace and contentment. So Jesus said in Matthew 6, 34, don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Monday's not here yet. Enjoy Sunday, okay? Yeah. Enjoy Sunday. Monday will get here soon enough. Today's trouble is enough for today, he said. So let's, let's be content. Let's be joyful. I have found, folks, that riches don't have anything to do with content. Some of the most wealthy people in the world by our standards are some of the most unhappy people in the world. I haven't seen the latest movie that's come out about Elvis. There's a brand new movie out about Elvis. My my kids went to watch it, and uh, and uh, Anna texted me back after she left the movie. She said, well, that was depressing, really depressing. <laughs> he had everything. He had everything this world owned. I don't know if you're an Elvis fan or not, but, but by his own admission, he was one of the most sad, miserable, depressed people who ever walked the face of the earth. And he had the peak of everything this world had to offer. As a matter of fact, I might have told this story before when I was in Bible college as pastor of First Assembly of God in Memphis. If you don't know, when Elvis was a little boy, he was raised in the Assembly of God Church in Tupelo, Mississippi, same network that we're a part of. Whenever he did go to church or whenever he went to talk to a pastor, he went to First Assembly of God in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. When I was in college, the pastor came and spoke at the church my grandmother went to. I was there at church a Sunday morning with my grandmother. And James Hamill, pastor of First Assembly of God in Memphis, was talking. He was the preacher that day. He said he was on a missions trip in Japan. He was in Tokyo. And he, he picks up a newspaper at a newsstand in Tokyo. And his picture's on the front page of the paper. And, of course, it's all Japanese characters. He doesn't know what it says. So he asks, he asks the news guy. He says, what, what, is, what does this say? And the guy says, headline says, Elvis Presley's pastor. And he's like, 
front page of the newspaper. It says, I'm Elvis Presley's pastor. He goes back to the hotel room. He shows his wife. See this? Got my picture on the front page of the paper. He says, you know what it says? It says, Elvis Presley's pastor's in town. She looks at him and she says, you're not doing a very good job, are you? <laughs> <laughs> but then he said, he said, Elvis came to me many times. He said, he sat in my office. Depressed, discouraged, sad. He said, Pastor, I've got all the money in the world. And I've got all the women in the world. And he says, I've done everything that you've told me not to do. And I've not done anything that you've told me to do. And I'm the most miserable man in the world. The pastor would talk to him. Repeat a prayer, often like we repeat at the end of our services. But he said, I knew. He was just saying words. See, the Bible says we got to speak with our mouth and believe in our heart. we got to make more than a confession. It takes more than just saying, Jesus, forgive me. you got to throw your life into Jesus' hands. And Elvis couldn't bring himself to do that. Some say it's because he had so many people on a payroll that were dependent upon his success that he was afraid he would put so many people out of work. But folks, no matter what the price is, there's no excuse. He knew, he knew, he knew. He had so many opportunities. He had so many blessings, and yet he lived his life. And that story, you know it, that story can be repeated over and over and over and over and over again. That next car won't make you happy. That next house won't make you happy. Nothing in this world, a great retirement fund that will get you retired early, that won't make you happy. Without Jesus, without recognizing he's our provider, without having that relationship with him, nothing's going to satisfy your soul. Nothing's going to satisfy your soul. More to own means more to lose. I've had relatives who've had a great, great deal. I have, a, I have an aunt who's my dad's younger sister. She was raised in the same condition my dad was raised in, house built before the Civil War. No electricity, no plumbing, not even an outhouse. Dad and I were driving down in the area the other day because we're taking care of the family cemetery down there now. We were driving around. He, Dad just says, I don't know why. We didn't even have an outhouse. He said, everybody else, at least they had an outhouse. Why didn't somebody put an outhouse together? I don't know. <laughs> can you imagine? Teenage, some of you can't, because some of you have grown up in similar circumstances. But, but younger ladies, can you imagine growing up with not electricity, no toilets in the house, and not even an outhouse? That's how you grow up. Tell you though what, you look at her high school picture, she's one of the best looking girls you'll ever see. So she came out of extreme poverty. And then for a season in her life, she was living in a mansion. Big mansion on the Gulf Coast. Beautiful. Just blessed unbelievably. And then something happened, and they lost what they had. And she's doing housekeeping in motels after she had lived in a mansion. But she's always had a phenomenal attitude. For the last six plus years, she's been in a nursing home because on Easter Sunday morning about six and a half years ago, she had a massive stroke that just calcified one half of her brain. And she's been laying in a nursing home for six plus years. And yet she's got the same attitude. How you doing today, Bonnie? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. The Lord's good. She's got a strong faith in the Lord. And she's gone from nothing to a lot to a little to laying in a nursing home. Can't do anything for herself. But she's got a phenomenal attitude. She's positive. She's upbeat. She's joyful because her relationship is in the Lord. Her satisfaction. Her now, am I saying Aunt Bonnie's never complained a day in her life? No, you know that's not true. But the overarching attitude is one of praise and not complaining. Joy and contentment that comes from the relationship with God, not from the stuff of this world. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, Paul said, Yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we brought nothing with us when we came to this world, and we can't take anything with us when we leave it. So if we have enough food and clothing, let's be content. So this first story in the Bible, the first story in the Bible tells us God provided. He's a provider of our food. He's a provider of our wealth. He's a provider of our life and breath. He's a provider of all of our resources. And folks, if we'll really believe that, if, 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 if what we teach and preach will become more than academic head knowledge, but if we'll really believe it, trust it, live by it, then grumbling will go away. 
giving will be in. And we will know God will meet all of our needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Let's stand together and let's spend some more time just worshiping the Lord. Just take a few moments right now, if you would, and just, just close your eyes and hold your hands out before the Lord and just take a few moments to let the Holy Spirit cause his word to sink into you. What is it that you need to trust God for today? What is it that you need to trust in his provision for you today? There's nothing too hard. There's nothing too difficult. But Paul teaches us that even when the answers all seem to come and everything seems to be going great physically and financially and emotionally and every other way, there's also those times when the answers don't seem to come. We don't seem to get the prayers answered the way we want them to. But we have to maintain this trust. We have to maintain this faith, this knowledge that God is our provider. So just take a few moments. And open your heart, open your mind right now. Let the Holy Spirit just speak to you and let him settle in your heart and in your spirit what you feel. The Holy Spirit wants to burn into you from this message today. Thank you, Jesus. trust in the Lord. If you need to have that assurance of salvation, if you need to put your trust in the Lord for the forgiveness of your sins for the first time or the first time in a long time, I just encourage you to do that right now. Right where you're at with your own words, just tell him, Lord, I need your forgiveness. I need your grace. I, all that I've done, I ask your forgiveness for. I trust, Lord Jesus, that you are God. I put my trust and my faith in you. And if you're doing that today, I'd love it if you'd let us know on that card just so we can pray with you. And we can be an encouragement to you. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to ask members of our prayer team to come. And as we worship the Lord, if you have a need today, there's folks here that want to pray with you. Whatever your need is. I know we prayed for one another earlier today, but we never want to miss an opportunity to pray for one another. So let's sing together. Let's worship the Lord together. If you need prayer, come. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He is worthy to be praised and adored. So we lift up holy hands. What a
church family. Thank you again for the love that exists here. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for encouraging us, Lord, as we go from this place. May your presence go with us every day this week. May we trust you. May we take joy in you. May we find our contentment, our happiness, our peace in you. Lord, continue to let us trust you for everything we need, everything we have, everything you want to give us, Lord. Let us take your kingdom. Let us take your kingdom everywhere we go into our community this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. Have a great, great Sunday. In grade 6 through 12, stick around for a West Tennessee Youth Gathering. Parents, we'll get them home to you. If you need prayer, we're going to stick around.